Um, well, welcome. We have today with uh, today we have uh, Katie and we have Tess. Is that the Tess or Tessa? Either way. Okay. And um, why don't you explain your connection first with Stanley Pollock? We are Katie's the first born mm -hmm. of our dad. Mm -hmm. I'm the second born, and he had three more sons following. Okay. And he was our dad. What what mm. more can we say? Okay, fantastic. So, um, where should we start? Um, tell me about the early memories of your dad. Can you start off with that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, very early memories, um, because he was only with us. He, he and our mum um, separated when I was about five mm -hmm. or something, and Tess was only three. So obviously those those um, are really scant. I can just about remember yeah. you know, sitting on his shoulders and um, things like that. Mm -hmm. But he was very good because the marriage split up, and um, before he remarried, mm -hmm. and and my mum remarried, he used to take us out at weekends, and he had to mum and dad mm. to us and we used to go down to this cottage that we rented with another family that mm. it was another guy I think he knew David Reynolds was he yeah, advertising I don't know that he was advertising but anyway it was a friend and so mm. they shared it and so he would take us just us two girls and um, he would take us um, <laughs> he took us out at weekends. And he before. also took us out in London, like he took us to London Zoo, and one of his favourite characters was Guy the Gorilla. All right. He loved animals, mm. and he had a real thing going with Guy the Gorilla. Him. All right. <laughs> and <laughs> Battersea Farm Fair, and he'd take us to the cinema. I mean, he, as he only s would see us at the weekends, really, or school holidays. Mm. He'd always do something with us. So he was a be, good dad. He was a good dad, so he kind of made up for it because it would always be something spectacular. Yeah, he okay. did. And he took us to Pritchard Wood, actually. Do you remember that? He was still there. Oh. It, um, it was Christmas time because I remember this because I remember going to his office mm. and zooming round and round in his chair or something. Oh, it's one of those God, I remember, yeah. yeah. And being very sick and his secretary having to... Do the clean up before he got back. Oh, no. And we had because well, they were giving lovely. us hot chocolate. They were like, "Oh, these sweet little girls, have some hot chocolate." No, this we round, round went mistake. into his office and was <laughs> spinning and spinning, and then she was like, "Oh." <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah, that was an early memory. So you made an indelible impression on Pritchard Wood. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and we had we had a Christmas lunch there actually in the canteen, so I can just about remember Pritchard Wood. Okay. Um, and then the father's race at school. That was a yeah. This is a real memory of dad. He mm -hmm. um, he by that by this stage he had lost his sort of wonderfully good looks as you'll see in his photograph album. He was a lovely looking young lad, but he and then and he got sort of bigger and um, less hair. So he he agreed to go in the father's race. Mm -hmm. We didn't so on like, sports mm -hmm. day. Right. It was our sports day at school, yeah. and he. Um, he sort of took um, took this jacket, I remember, and sort of there were all this r row of kind of athletic-looking dads, oh. and um, he was sort of right. <laughs> my sporting history. Here we go, and uh, made made for it, had his glasses still on, and um, and made a lunge, and they're all off, and he went flying, <laughs> tripped on the grass or something like that, and landed very unceremoniously on the grass, and. Um, um, and oh, we were always God. being really, oh God, it's our dad. And someone said, I was sitting on the benches watching, and, and he said, his father is that? <laughs> so he was, although we were wonderfully proud of him because he's brilliant, we were also mega embarrassed about many things. Well, that's, that's the job of dads. I understand that because I'm a dad. So exactly, that. it's the job of any parent. Was, it's sometimes yeah. the most embarrassing person. I thought you were life. going to tell a story about how he streaked through the finishing no. line. No. He would love to have done. No, he Wish. landed flat on his face. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was... Um, yeah. Fair enough. So what would you say made him tick? So, uh, well, he used to, for our birthdays, he would take us out, he'd I remember him taking me out to restaurants and things, and he would love to talk about, um, he would talk about, you know, advertising and work when I was pretty young and impressionable myself, and, and you too, and, um... So he brought his work in, so he was always thinking did. and talking he about was, it. Yeah. And, and, and it was interesting, so we did get a sort of feeling, and, and, and when he began sort of 
talking about planning and things, mm. I remember that and trying, trying to understand what it was all about. Uh, as young things, we were impressed because it was he was you know the smash. Um, Martians were kind of like really cool to sort of be so you saw that on TV so yeah that was yeah like, yeah okay. and he'd sometimes bring products home for us to try like I remember this lip gloss and want to have our opinion mm. is this worth selling do you like this asking us what do you think of this lip gloss it was a <laughs> yeah. new thing then it was no mm -hmm. such thing mm -hmm. yeah and I have a vague memory of him talking I think we'd question him about the moral thing of advertising is it really right what mm. you're doing like sell lies and selling people things and he, we'd have discussions out over the dinner table about things and he was fine that. with that yes he would he would yes he would justify me over the wine and the cigarettes and all of that <laughs> which was all very part because he would relax into that and mm. he would like he would talk for hours and hours into the early hours of the morning at home and stuff so, so it sounds like he treated you like adults quite early. I would say so. Oh. I don't think he had a lot of patience for young children, really. I mean, what no. do you think? But yes, because I remember when I was fairly young and there was an election or something going on, and um, I remember saying, oh, I, I, would, I would vote Labour, but, I, you know, they're really good. And he said, you don't know what you're talking about, don't be <laughs> silly. So he could <laughs> totally dismiss our points of view, too. Um, and how old were you then? Oh, it's probably about nine, <laughs> something <laughs> like that. So okay. pretty young, yeah. But it, you know, we did like. He'd to talk a lot to Katie because I think you spent a bit more time with him when you were younger, and I yeah. was cripplingly shy. But I would just listen intently to everything, and I'd absorb what mm -hmm. he's saying. But I was so quiet; it's unbelievable. It's like Katie used to speak for me, <laughs> and um, but he said to me once, "Oh, you're." He, he was watching me listening he said you're you're just like an animal because he understood i was really absorbing what mm. he was saying but katie and him would dominate the dinner table kind of oh, and not in a bad nice. way yeah because he was trying to educate you as well you talk about many subjects like politics history. history he loved talking about history history was his passionate subject at school i would say and, so, and what well, i mean what sort of areas were there any particular parts of history that he was in renaissance history mm. henry the <laughs> all of that and okay. yes he was fascinated with that and mm. the whole sort of reformation and everything so yes and so if whatever we were doing at school if i was doing a particular thing at school and, I, and you once you start to get a little bit of knowledge you start getting really opinions and i thought how dreadful the whole empire was i remember reading about sort of us you know um, in, in history when we're sort of in our empire days and um, so I was very down on Britain and he was sort of yeah. so was, sorry so he, was he coming back to a kind of left-wing household all the time and he was fighting back as a bit of a no. writer or not <laughs> <laughs> no he wasn't actually I mean no it was just my sort of he was very he was quite very Tory I suppose mm. in, in certain ways and mm. very traditional but he was very he would listen to everything you said and yeah. he wasn't he was he was good because he would put different points of view and it was great we could have a long discussion about um, any topic really he, he loved a fight basically didn't he oh you're going to get I'm not, no, I'm not going there yet actually but just yeah. you know, but what I'm talking is that what we're here to, I'm talking about is he, he'd pick an argument with anybody and that's what he enjoyed he would and he liked, he liked a good reasoning yeah. yes but it was fine he was fine mm. if you could justify your corner of your, your point um, you know so that was where I learned with him how to fight my own corner I suppose okay. how to get my own opinions justify them because he would say yes but this and then oh yes but this so it was a tennis match and he allowed you to do that sure. which I appreciate so much and he, and he argued fair he didn't sort of pull the rug as adults would sometimes do no he did he did argue fair unless there were other people there and then he would maybe may be slightly different but um but there was the greatest thing about our dad, I think, is his sense of humour. Even if you're having a very serious conversation, right. he had the best sense of humour. And that was one of his major assets to me, I'd say. And, and what form did that humour take? I mean, was it like um, witticisms or practical jokes or what? Not practical jokes. No. no. Was it verbal? I no, he would be very witticism. Yeah, say, but really. he was also very self-deprecating indeed, and he um, could laugh at himself. Yeah, yeah. And um, 
Yes, but he, he that would always be at the dinner table. There would be other times, for example, when we used to drive down to mm. the countryside where we had this cottage, and um, we always broke down. The car was always breaking down. <laughs> and he was always late, and he was completely hopeless with anything mechanical. Totally, um, was, was it another car? I mean, no, no, no especially. <laughs> no. But we, it, in those days, I think cars were not like they are now. No, and they, that's true. It would run out of water, or it would do something. So you'd have smoke coming out of the bonnet. <laughs> And he would get all in a fluster, sweating. <laughs> he would open the bonnet because if he knew what he was doing, and then he'd, you'd hear these fra la 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 background things. And um, but he felt, and the same with the lawnmower, it mm. would never start, and he'd be kind of cursing away at the lawnmower, trying to pull this thing in the garden. And um, he felt really bad that he wasn't able. Yeah, he felt very to inadequate on that male level of being practical and. He could right. just about change a plug, and that was about as far as... So he wanted go. to be practical, but that's... He would have struggling. loved to, he I'm sure. He felt it was a slight on his manhood, <laughs> definitely. Okay. And but he, once when he bumped into the car, you remember, <laughs> he kind of bumped into a car, and then he was like, fa la fa la 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 <laughs> he didn't want to swear in front of us. He suddenly got himself <laughs> oh, no. oh. fa la 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 <laughs> 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 No, he lo- yeah, he he did. It did make him feel, and I think that also mm. stemmed back from his army days, um, mm. because he was um, he had to do national conscription. He was mm. in those, those that era, and um, he apparently um, I think they had some tests they had to take before mm. they were delegated, and he should have been sort of officer material, I suppose he thought he should be, um, mm. but he didn't pass this very simple test, so he was lumped in with. <laughs> with so everyone. That, and test, that test where they give you logs and ropes and you've got to get five men across the pond some, or something. Uh, it's not gonna work. <laughs> something like that. Oh, okay. and he, so he, he felt very humiliated yeah, yes. in these ways mm-hmm. and um, um, apparently his leave, if he had a particularly unpleasant sergeant mm-hmm. who um, made him call through nettles and things if there was a tiny bit of toothpaste left on his toothbrush. Mm-hmm. And, so, um, yeah, I think it all stemmed back to that. He wasn't sort of, you know, showing his manly. Yeah. Although he was a very male person, slightly chauvinistic, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Did you he want to die a very male person. He was, was, yes. In other ways, you mm, know. Absolutely. Okay, spare time, sort of leisure pursuits. I mean, uh, we've ta- talked about the wine, we've talked about the, uh, the cigarettes, uh, which was kind of the constant accompaniment, having a bottle of claret or something over lunch every mm. day or whatever it was. Right. But in terms of his spare time, what sort of things Well, he, he loved gardening. Okay. When we were in the country, he loved nature, he loved animals. He loves socialising, mm. I mean, yeah, obviously, over a bottle of wine, <laughs> and we all know. Music. <laughs> music. Music. Into music. Classical music. Like, yeah, I remember him just... going into the sitting room when he had work to do, like, he had a speech to write. Mm. He'd shut the door so no one was allowed in, and he'd play classical music, he loved classical music, and be there for hours writing his speech for Monday morning. Mm. But he needed to be on his own. Obviously. Absolute quiet and concentration for that. Yeah, he loved music. Did he draw or paint at all? No. Although his father did, obviously his father was an artist, okay. um, but no, I think he would like to be. But he loved. He took us to art galleries when we were younger and um, tried to. I remember sort of going to the Tate Gallery or something and saying, you know, at some modern paintings, oh, that doesn't look particularly brilliant. Why am I not so clever about <laughs> it's a that? Load of rubbish. <laughs> and he said, yes, but you've got to understand, they didn't just go slosh. They did each little thing. And, 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 Another so, argument breaks out, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, yes, we would debate on the merits of various paintings and things. No, he did, he loved, and of course, because his father was taught by Holman Hunt, so okay. there was pre-Raphaelite pictures all over the place, and he loved the pre-Raphaelites because of his father's influence. Um, what was his father's name? Pollard? <laughs> yeah. Charles Stanley. Charles Stanley, yes, because I've seen it on the internet. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Okay. I've seen a couple of the other uh, paintings. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. Which you can, again, if you search for Stanley Pollard, his father comes yes, up. Yes, that's oh, right. Because wow. uh, you can still see prints uh, on sale. Yes, that's right. I've, mm-hmm. I've seen which, that one. Yeah, which is why I was fishing about the paintings. Yeah, yeah. It? no, he, he was, and, and we had, he inherited a load of the, of Holman Hunt drawings and things like that from his father. Did and, he? Yeah. Well, where are they now? Um, well, <laughs> some of them are uh, in, in Sussex mm. with um, our stepmother, and mm. um, some, have been some have been sold. Sold to a museum? The museum, yes, mm. because they were, they were going to get, um, they were going to 
deteriorate because yes, they really look yeah, yeah. yeah. And so they went to a museum mm. and uh, yeah. So interesting. Okay. Um, someone said to me he was a devout Catholic. He ah, you are too. Aren't you? I mean, not Catholic, no. but you're you're quite religious. I'm quite religious. How did you pick that one up? <laughs> on your on your um, website. Oh, the website, the blog's out. Yeah. Right, it's come back. Oh, okay. I didn't see that. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes, yeah, so he he wasn't because well, he obviously he and my our mother divorced, mm. and um, so he was basically, especially at that time, so and he turned his back on Catholicism, yeah. and um, then he at about the age of 40 it's the sort of classic thinking about your life and yeah. things he went uh, he read some Taya to Shada and mm -hmm. read, read those books and mm -hmm. got, became fascinated with mm -hmm. the whole philosophy behind it went to Farm Street talked to various Jesuit mm -hmm. um, priests and things and then came fully back into it even though he wasn't able really to take communion because the divorce was yeah. obviously mm -hmm. um, so, but he then he he brought he we were sort of baptized as Catholics and he but the, the boys um, were christened um, mm. but then he they then went to a Catholic school mm. and and they sort of became sort of they took their communion I think did they do that I'm not sure but they went to a Catholic school so he was school actually anyway. this was quite an important era it was, like it was and okay. so he did yeah he went every Sunday and um, got to know the priests and. Okay. No, I was just I said it was just one person mentioned this to me. And I just thought I'd check that story. Yeah, out. No, yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, what do you think? Oh, let's talk about the boxing. <laughs> okay, I think this has been something's gone wrong here because I've spoken to my mother mm. and I've spoken to my stepmother. Yeah. And it wasn't Cambridge because there's talk of him having a blue. That's right. And my stepmother says she has this blue, but it's from school. Ah, it's school. So okay. it wasn't. It was just a sport at school. I okay. think it's kind of been slightly... It's been mythologised. Mythologised. So. Although yeah. he, he had a sort of broken nose, which was supposed to be from boxing, but whether it was just a street fight, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, we've been told he could pack a punch, hmm. if necessary. And <laughs> sorry, sorry we have been told. Who told you? Um, Did he I tell think you? my mother. Okay. I think my mother. Yes, he did use to get involved in fights there. You but know, he could look to... after himself. Basically. Yeah, he could look after himself. But he wasn't someone who'd pick a fight for no reason. Mm. Have you been told otherwise? I've been told otherwise. Oh, really? Okay. Well, yes. We're not aware of that. Let's <laughs> try it. Let's try it. No, but I've been told that. He'd pick a physical fight. Just... I was told that one of the things he used to do on a Friday night was to walk through Soho with people drinking outside pubs and kind of nudge into them, whatever, and I hope they would all start kicking off whatever else to have a little bit of a jostle around and stuff. I saw him talking about well, that. Well, I read that and I was like, that doesn't sound like my dad. <laughs> so I don't know. Fantastic. I really don't, don't know. He used to practice, on not practice on us, but he used to sort of get, say, this is how you punch, and, you know, and, and I remember him. He did have a slightly sadistic he streak because he used to squeeze our hands really tight until it was... Okay, <laughs> but not like in an abusive way. No, no, just no. kind of like, no, no. The, the reason how why much I... pain can you take? Before well, you and go? and when you said stop, it would be a little bit too long before. Yeah, you... <laughs> yeah. but it was not mean. It was yeah. just. It was just jostling. You know, he was yeah. like you, you up, up a bit. He was toughening you up. But the, the, sorry, the reason why it's important is because um, the the way in which he he conceived of planning was not in a process way where you're saying, well, you know, that's your job, you know, when, when, when the advertising is going down this assembly line, because uh -huh. it was never conceived in that way, of course, that's your bit, that's your bit, and your bit, but much more like a ring, uh -huh. where the creative's got their corner, the account man has got their corner, the client's got their corner, right. and the planner is out there fighting their corner. And so there was a sense of, you're out there, verbal uh -huh. fisticuffs and all of that. Okay. Right. So, I mean, that has been traced back to the fact that he did like a Barney, if it was necessary. That ah, was like... I see. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> so that was why I just thought I'd check that one out. Okay. I mean, he never came home with a black eye or any sign of bruise or injury. That's all I can say. No Wait, cuts, no bruises. His, <laughs> mom, mom would tell you differently. Oh, really? When he was younger. When I was yeah. too young. I just, you know. Okay, so when he was younger, he was coming home with cuts and bruises. Was, yeah. Interesting story. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, what... Why d did he get into advertising? Do you know what, how he told yes. you why he was in that when you were telling him what an immoral thing it was and all the rest of it? Well, before that, it was um, from Cambridge. One of his closest friends, who is still still around, who's in Paris, um, yeah. um, his father was in advertising. In fact, he's in our. We've got a picture of a mm. Richard Wood dinner in right. there, and he's there. His father was John Glogue, right. who is um, um, a Richard Wood, mm. and he 
um, was very fond of Stanley, of, yep. of our dad, and um, I think he introduced him to Richard Wood. So I, I don't know quite um, how it worked, but that's certainly that was the connection, okay. and that that got him in. So I don't I don't know whether he because okay. he did a law degree, so mm. whether he would have it's ended just up. It's one of these things people came out of almost um, odd degrees and found yeah. themselves in it. So I was just wondering about that. And what do you think? What he got out about advertising because he was obviously passionate about it. He couldn't leave it alone. He brought his work home with him and he so on. Did. Why? Why do you think it was so important for him? The people. I think he was. So, he was in awe of the creative side. Yeah. Certainly, and he would. He, he just the brightness and the way in which it worked. He was and the slickness of some yeah. of some people. Um, so I think he just loved being part of that creative process, yeah. even though he wasn't a creative himself. He loved to foster it. He loved to. Um, he loved to see, you know. Mm. It, it, to him, it was it was artistry, really. It was it was. So he, he loved it. Okay. From point of view, and, and and just the being with bright young minds. I think he loved. He just loved that whole. Okay. And you said you were in the. Um, you joined BMP as a copywriter, Katie. Um, just before he died, was he still working then? No, no, after he died. It was after he died, right, right. Died. So you were never in the agency at the same point? No, was... no, I don't think he would have la allowed that. No, no, no. not? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> You're going, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and, um, I mean, this persona, and I've talked to uh, you know, quite a lot of people that sort of describe um, him sort of shuffling down a corridor, um, coming into a meeting, going fishing through his pockets to find a cigarette, you know, there's a whole <laughs> kind of ritual involved in it. And, and, and I would talk to one person who basically talked to him for an entire hour and didn't understand a single thing he said. So the yeah, kind of he was renowned for his mumbling. The mumbling. Yeah. Of, and it's back to the audience when he was yes. giving a speech. That's why I think Martin Bowes, the cool suave one, yes. took the speeches he wrote because he could present it so more slickly. And yes. He was renowned, even just mumbling on the phone. Yeah, oh, well, he was. Well, 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 yeah. well, well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he would have loved to have been slick himself and been able to do that. To but so he, yeah, himself, but, he, yeah. but his mind was, I mean, he could write yes. so fantastically, but he just could not present, could not stand there. But that's interesting because, you know, in some ways, why didn't he do more writing? Because what I've got here is I've got three articles by him. That's a lot. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Wow! Oh, we've never seen that. <laughs> we've never no. seen that. We've we'll some training. So, um, so you know, th there's very little that he's written, which is ironic because, as you say, he's a very clear writer. Yeah. Yes. And um, you know, in some ways, the the irony is that you know we, we wish he'd written more <laughs> because, in terms of um, if he was finding it so hard to speak, it was almost until he was in that sort of table host with the bottle open, the fags open, when he could kind of thump the table and hold forth. Yeah. Almost, that's where he could come alive. But the rest exactly. of the time, he was almost like this professor figure who's yes, just sort of shuffling around waiting for his moment. He was. That's a real shame, yeah. I think he would have done had he lived longer. I mean, he was mm. only 49 when he died. And he was, um, his other interest, you asked about his other interests, mm. he was passionate also about education. Right. And he got involved locally in, with a, a Montessori um, mm. school. Was it Montessori? No, sorry, it wasn't Montessori. It was... Um, Mm. Oh, what's the name of that? Rudolf Steiner. Rudolf Steiner. That's it. Oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, Steiner yeah, School. Yeah. And they were, um, they were. Uh, it was a school that dealt with um, autistic and um, handicapped children. Mm. Um, and he was in awe of the woman who ran it, and mm. he really he did quite a lot to help them. And um, I think education-wise, he had a certain sort of views on how education should be, and he would have written. I think he would have loved to have spent time doing that, but he kept being called back to of the course. advertising and like what I mean, what sort of views um uh, well <laughs> it's difficult to say yeah. <laughs> he just it just was so important to him that it was um it was it like unconventional not the way most people got educated that he thought it was something no no it was quite different. traditional really okay. but i just it was just so important to him that everyone had the opportunity mm. to be educated and i mean he 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 wasn't sort of a, a great um Left wing, you know, sort of everyone um, comprehensive no. education because like we we were sort of at school just around the time when the eleven plus was mm. scrapped and um, um, he was very determined that we wouldn't sort of you know he wanted us to get as good an education as possible, possible. Yeah. Um, and um, so he wasn't. I don't. It's, it's difficult actually because I, I I don't really know if I think about it what he, his views were. Do you? Um, no. It's just that how you know education, education, it was so important. But 
I don't know, I know he was just fascinated by the way, the techniques that they had at this school mm. for these kids who really needed extra mm. specialised help. I think it was very targeted, sort of, mm. um, um, that's what interested him, how you could bring out people who were, um, you know, would not be able to go into the ordinary system. Sure. No, I'm, just, I'm just curious, because in effect he was an educator, and you know, I haven't spoken to some of the people he taught, but the way he did it, and uh, there was a particular... Um, uh, account where uh, Jim Williams was explaining that um, whenever he had a big presentation the next day, it wasn't there wasn't time for him late to go down to Sussex to to get home. So therefore, he'd have to stop overnight somewhere, and therefore he'd have to go for dinner. And that was a golden opportunity to say, "Oh, can I join you for dinner then?" Yes. <laughs> he'd sit there. The bottle of wine would come out, and yeah. then. You know, know, it would he, be wonderful, actually, and yes, yeah, so many people love you know, that. That's so and, I mean, you know, people would spot that, and that's what they wanted. So you know, most yeah. every, every story of someone, and I've therefore spoken to perhaps five people who he hired. It's all the same thing, or they they were really impressed because he took them down the pub after arguing with them over the salary or whatever. It was. <laughs> um, but you know, everyone else got stupid exercises at other agencies, but he take them down the pub and get them drunk or whatever yes. it was. So there was this sense of you know everyone. That was the moment. That was when the teaching and the educating happened, which was yeah. why I'm kind of. I think it was almost with him. It was almost a test. Actually, he would see how how well, how many bottles it would take to get you under the table and right. then and, uh, you know he would really enjoy that because he could uh, take quite a bit and <laughs> he always um, won he always <laughs> won and <laughs> he would see what you were made of by how much drink you could okay, take okay there's a character test interesting right <laughs> so did you ever have too much to drink while he was still alive um, quite possibly I don't, <laughs> don't remember I'm mean, was... just checking if he tried the test on you that was all. <laughs> not really he what? took me to a pot I can't remember how old I was I was already in the slit. Mm. He took me in the country to a party up the lane, and um, I was drinking gin and tonics, uh, and then I was like wobbling back and uh, walking down the country lane, and I just got into bed, and I was just like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> no, so he, he, that was, but that was my first experience with really, gin and tonic. I mean, he'd always but, take us to the pub, wouldn't he? Wouldn't in days when I guess he did, it wasn't sort of like family friendly pubs in no. those days, yeah. and. Um, and yes, he loved he loved the banter with everyone. He liked to talk to you know the oldest village yeah, member George. Loved, yeah, right. Yeah, all about. He loved just ordinary people in the pub. He wasn't mm -hmm. sort of you know snooty about. He talked to anyone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he'd be, and he would always. One thing I think was so good about him was mm -hmm. he always wanted to see the good in people. He was not sort of like oh, I didn't want to talk to that person because of that. He would want to say, you know, what's good about that person, mm -hmm. and he, and he would hone in on that, and he would talk to them about what their skill was or whatever. And he'd be interested in mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Except that I remember <laughs> this. Is, I he, I remember he he sort of said, what are you, what are you going to do when you grow up? So when I was about fourteen or something, thirteen, fourteen, and I said I I want to be a writer. I want to be a writer, and he just burst out laughing and said. Huh. And so he wasn't sort of making, don't be ridiculous, huh. you've got to go to Oxford or Cambridge to do that. And I said, no, I don't, I don't. So he was like that. But then, just to vindicate that, he, um, this is just just before he died, actually, um, I, I, I was at university and I was messing at the station um, and I entered a competition at a university a poetry competition and I've won it amazingly enough mm -hmm. and he was so thrilled he was so delighted and we got on the train coming back from <clears throat> meeting him from work and he was he just went into the buffet car for the buffet car and, and said everyone this is my daughter she's won the poetry competition <laughs> everyone have a drink and it, was, every, it was like this year and I was like woo <laughs> And um, he was so proud and so happy, and that was just one little thing. So, so even though it sounded like he was being ridiculously pompous at that time, he wasn't at all. He was, he was thrilled for any achievement. But he was with. testing. He was testing all the time, I suppose, whether you yeah. just say it or whether you really meant it. So you were proving it. Okay. Um, a, a couple of questions, really. Um, the Pritchard Wood situation, when the agency, they wouldn't let them buy out and so on, and therefore setting up. Did he ever talk to you as to going out on a limb and starting an, as an agency? Why did he do that? Cause well, we were too young, else, really, really, then we were... He never talked to you about that, and no. why he did it? Because I don't have any memory of that. That's we went What to, year was that? It was, it was the 68. 
It was 68, 68. because when Carol was pregnant, because there's a picture of all of us mm -hmm. at Bob Jones's house, I think yeah. it was Bob Jones's house, when the, all the five um, directors were there, yeah. and um, so they had a, a thing. And I just remember, like, wow, we're breaking away, like, isn't this exciting? Mm -hmm. And we've got, and they had the Cadbury's smash account, and they had, yeah. it was all sort of there, and it was really exciting. He was so. I remember the excitement that he had. I didn't really understand what he was no, doing. I thought you'd be very young for that. But I just yeah. wondered, because, you know, it's a big thing to put your house <laughs> for mortgage to start up an agency. And what then happened, um, from what I heard, was that there was a problem with Smash, which was basically they made this commercial which didn't work out very well. So the client wouldn't pay for it. So they had to fund it. So they had to remortgage again. So all of those kind of oh, things right. are quite important. Yeah. Because in the end, they really had to stick at it to make this thing work. Make, yeah, so before right. BMP became the huge success that it became, it was quite a difficult beginning. And I just wondered if that was something you never talked about. Yeah, no, no. I'm not aware of that. Okay. Yeah. And um, you said he talked to you about planning. Um, <laughs> I didn't expect him to have ever talked to you about planning or that much. What, what was the sort of things that you remember, if at all, that he talked to you about? Why on earth he'd want to kind of, not only start an agency, but but I suppose move things around and do things differently and how would he explain that to you? It was basically in, um, mm. I remember trying to understand what mm. planning was. So I'd ask questions, I, I didn't understand the difference between market research mm. and between what planning was. So mm. it's very, it is from an outside mm. point of view, what is the difference? And so he tried to explain to me what that was and I, I can't really remember the conversation that we had but I, I just knew that planning was this sort of much more comprehensive and I know that he always expressed, he had a huge respect for the housewife, if you like. Mm -hmm. the he said, no, you know, you cannot ever sort of um, make any assumptions and, that, and he's always very impressed just by what ordinary people think mm -hmm. of the product and he said that's how you, you really understand and learn by seeing people's reactions and they're really, you know, people have got so much more common sense and understanding mm -hmm. and you have to be so aware of that as working in, in, in this industry mm. um, and respect that and mm. um, so I think that was that was what he always taught me that there was a huge res it wasn't this kind of like oh let's con the consumer sort mm. of attitude that people associate with advertising mm. it was very much a respect and a sort of we can learn from them and mm. we can therefore mm -hmm. um, produce what will be more effective and and do you remember him ever doing any of this himself? As in, because he hired these youngsters and he sent them out and they were doing groups three nights a week, they were interviewing people, talking to people, whatever. Did, did you ever see him sort of suddenly almost dropping out uh, of a sort of normal situation, suddenly asking questions about a product or advertising, whatever? Is that something he did himself? Or was he what, to ask? What, what, or or you saw him doing it with other people? I have funny memory, I don't yeah. know where this comes from, that he would be with a client, I guess, and spend the whole night over dinner and mm. wine discussing which was the better toilet paper, the tissue one or the paper one. Who <laughs> <laughs> was so passionate about, you know, doing the right thing and I think he believed in the tissue paper. <laughs> I hope he did. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really remember really what the loop paper was at home, which was the hard paper, the soft paper. Was, it was a defining characteristic. <laughs> you, you said that he, had, um, he was an, an embarrassing dad. Have you got some embarrassing dad stories? Um, well, I, I joined, I, I lived in, I went down to live in Sussex after mm. I finished university mm. for a year, so I took my gap year, I suppose yeah. you call it now, um, there, and, um, no, before, sorry, before I went to university, yeah. and, um, yeah, after my A-levels, and uh, I joined the amateur dramatics mm. um, thing, and I remember him picking me up in the evening after mm. we were rehearsing for this play, mm. And um, the people in the car, he came in a little bit early, which was unusual for him. Mm. And the people sort of in the car saying, uh, what's the caretaker doing coming in there? Because he was standing <laughs> at the doorway. <laughs> and I was going, oh no, it's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so, he, so things like that. Things but, like that. Yeah. But he was... Um, he didn't collect you as a, in a present, presentation like a format. He'd come shopping. No, no, he, he, yeah. Like. He so did. what do you remember about the teenage years? Because it sounds as if you were, you were seeing him at the weekends and he was sort of deciding the kind of people you're going to be and what you're into and all of that. What do you, what do you remember about those years? Did he ever pace, pace around in pyjamas waiting for you at night? Mm. <laughs> he did once. No. Really? Yeah. Because <laughs> normally we were with my mum and it was, it was a sort of different thing mm. but he, he liked to know, you know, when we were going to be back and he did get worried or mm. something. So how um, late was that? Was it one a.m. or eleven? Well, I think I was actually I was doing a, I was working. Mm. I was 
when I was quite young actually mm. I, was, uh, I was only about 15 or 16 and I, oh. I was doing some waitressing thing and someone was supposed to be giving me a lift so he was sort of like where is she, where is she? And, um, <laughs> panic panic yeah but normally he was really cool about okay I think it, I was more the embarrassing daughter obviously when I joined the slit or just before I joined the slit famous punk rock group mm. um, <laughs> the news of the world came knocking on my door right and you know it's my first experience of doing an interview I wasn't prepared for it mm. and obviously I just gave some cheeky answers and then on Monday morning I was slapped on his desk look at look at your daughter look at your daughter was there a photograph Yes, yes. I've I've still got the cutting okay. somewhere, and it says these girls make the Sex Pistols look like choir boys. <laughs> That's and the kind of headline you want, absolutely. <laughs> and then I rang him up. I was like, Dad, did you see me in the paper? <laughs> He's like, Yes, really stern, and he just didn't want to talk to me. I think it was a huge embarrassment to him because I think it was just a shock for the general public. This whole punk explosion just as if it was starting to happen okay so i mean this is a bit of a digression but um <laughs> there's a short answer to it but how did you get involved in the slits and why, why were you doing it as in you know what why were you going the punk route in what that would have been in 76 77? 76 mm -hmm. yes well i'm being a creative person mm -hmm. i just i don't know i just fell into it i was there at the right time I was learning to play music. Right, so I, I wanted to do something creative. That was my biggest thing. I, was, I left college. I was right towards the end of. So you were playing. Doing what? My you were playing bass by then. I started on the guitar, but I was just messing around, mm. and then I just happened to come into contact with these girls, and we just clicked. Mm. And that was in West Sussex. It was like no, 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 no. This is in London. In London. So I left. London, I, West I was in London. I was oh, living right. in London. Yeah. And. Um, <laughs> I think eventually, you know, because I was 17, mm. I think eventually he got it, but within two years he was dead. So he, you know, he took me out for a meal with the Spanish drummer and he suddenly realized, I think she's okay. I think everything's okay. <laughs> but I think it was just the hugest shock to him and probably quite embarrassing, you know. Did, did he ever sort of talk to you about it and try and give career advice about the music business? No. <laughs> okay. It's just like you get on with that. <laughs> I mean, I, mean I love music, you know, that's, I have a passion for music. That's what we would have in common, I'd say. Sure, but um, I guess, was this something where he is just at a loss or actually you, there was a fair amount of conflict about it? Did he, did he ever end up stand up rouse over it where he didn't approve of no, the No, 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 but he just didn't want to talk to me. I think it was, you know, when the... News of the world was put on his desk on Monday morning. It was just well. Well, that that <laughs> don't know what you're doing there. <laughs> but I mean, uh, okay. In terms of what you were getting into with the slits, the whole point was tearing up everything which had happened before. Yes. And to what extent? I mean, were you? Uh, was this kind of really great fun and energising, or were you angry? Yes. Was, well, was there it, was, was a lot of anger there, but it was a, from a female point of view. It's yeah. like we're not going to put up with this anymore. Yeah not just female but the general state of politically what was going on mm. just like no we're going to change this why do we have to live like this yeah and did you ever discuss the politics of it with them? no because i think we became a bit distant because yeah. obviously uh, we were going on tour we were playing and so we kind of became a bit distant but i think just before he died we kind of made peace did he ever see you at a gig no no, you never Kate is the only one, none of the rest of the family, no. <laughs> so what do you remember about going to see Tessa the Slits? I was so proud for my sister, but she was, um, she was, it, she, it was sort of like, wow, your sister's one of the Slits? Yeah. And it was sort of like, hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was, so it was great to be kind of fighting back and doing these wacky things. Mm -hmm. um, it was, yeah, it was, it was quite exciting. And at the time I was at university and so th my fellow students were the like... The cachet would have been fantastic yeah, for college. Yeah, it was amazing, <laughs> yes, it was. No, so it was, it was fascinating. I was just intrigued, really. And, um, yeah, I thought it was fantastic. She was doing what she was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of... The, the, co the, the, the thing at the time was, yes, be shocking, be mm. horrendous and sort of... And were you being shocking at the same mm, time? Not in the same way, no. Just being a bit wacky, I suppose. But um, trying to do my own thing, mm. yeah. In, in my way. I mean, it's a shame we never really discussed it because it would have been like 
because it was the female thing and as I said he had that little bit of chauvinism thing mm. about it him it would have been an interesting discussion we could have had about so you it. but I think that, years later back, I mean did you ever have that sort of feminist argument with him and accuse him of being a chauvinist because I've got daughters mm. of 15 and 18 and they'd take me on if they wanted to yeah. really <laughs> No, I think because I didn't see a great deal of my dad yeah. really from yeah, what, the what, age of sixteen. I didn't see much of him. And what did your mum make of it all? Well, there's a funny story. Is <laughs> the priest? Oh, yes. the priest came round, the local priest, because yeah. he's a Catholic, and she said, "Oh, my daughter's done an album." He said, "Oh, oh, let me see, let me see the record." And she's like, "No, no, I don't, I don't think Which one you'd it? like it." The, the mud cover. Oh, all right, that the was the covered. infamous melody maker cover or whatever it was. <laughs> like, no, really, really, I don't think you you'd like it. It's like please, please. So she showed it to me. He's just like, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> it's very nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. Well, we're just just building on this and. and Okay, so you, you were a copywriter briefly. What did you then get on to do, Katie? I, did, I carried on copywriting. I went from um, BMP. I stayed at BMP. Well, I went to BMP. Mm. Then I took off on, on a summer holiday mm. and then um, went to I uh, went to India. I sort mm. of took off and yeah. I wrote back and I said, look, I'm, I've got to do this thing. I'm going to India. So I went off to India and then I came back and they um, they changed creative directors and things, um, but they offered me a job back. So I was really pleased. So mm. I got another art directory and I stayed for two or three years and I think then they had enough of me really and then I moved on I went to Air Barco which is another agency mm -hmm. um, and um, I was there for about three years and then I went freelance and I, I, I got into boats and things I'm still into boats I suppose uh -huh. and so my river does boats pay? <laughs> no. No, no, of course that was a stupid question. It certainly doesn't. It was a stupid thing to do, really. And um, um, oh, it's a different way of life, life living on the oh, river. Oh, you live on you live on the river. Yeah. Sorry, when you say getting into boats, I just want to, you know. Yes, I've been a boat designer for years. <laughs> no, no, um, no. I I lived on the river, which wasn't very conducive to commuting up to London, and uh, and I ended up with sort of manky looking hands and things like that. And um, that's I I was going to work at Davidson Pierce, but then. I went to see the, I went to see the um, uh, managing director because mm -hmm. I got the job and then unfortunately I had all this gunky stuff on my hands and he said, you're not going to be working on a Pons account like that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was that. So I decided to go freelance. So I worked as a copywriter um, <laughs> locally at various agencies and freelance for a few okay. years and did that. And now you live on the boat. And well, well with no, a family, you have a yeah, family. Yeah, I have, mm -hmm. I have four children, and um, yeah, we've been working on our mooring and boat and things. We've still got with another boat. We're still more about boat. Chelsea, which is you know, Chelsea. Um, yeah, so yeah. Okay. And um, <clears throat> so, and in terms of what you've been doing since, so the the slits finished in so the eighty one. Eighty one. And you reformed in two thousand and six briefly. 2005, 2006, yes. Yeah. For a similar amount of time, I mean, the original slits five years, and yeah. then five years with new members, me and the singer. In between, I studied martial arts, funnily enough, I guess that's some connection to my dad. Uh, I yeah, studied. Which is why there is a punch bag. Oh, look, there's a punch bag. Yeah, yes. right, okay. yes. <laughs> um, I studied martial arts for 15 years, jiu jitsu. Mm -hmm. And. I've always loved drawing. I've mm. never made a career of it. I mm. have a daughter as well, mm. who I brought up on my own because mm. my father died at a very young age. Yeah. And I do reflexology now in a detox centre for alcoholics mm. and drug addicts once a week. Mm. And I'm just starting to do a bit of music with some new people now. Mm. Okay. So, um, I mean, it's funny to think of your father not thinking of you as particularly creative because the two of you are very creative. Are you not? I would oh, say so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we are. I think the thing is, he died. He died before he had a chance to see us properly grown up, really. Mm. And yeah. um, so we was. I was still sp just at the end. I was just about to do my finals when he mm. died. Mm. And um, Tessa was sort of immersed in. I didn't uh, do so well at school. I'm sure it was a disappointment to him. But I don't think it was actually because I. Do, I think he. As long as he felt that you. We're doing something that you were passionate about. 
and it, you were good at that was it was fine and yeah he, he wasn't sort of like you've got to, he wasn't the sort of father that thought you've got to go Maybe into this more profession we were do girls this. do you think i don't know I actually don't know. but i don't know i don't know i mean he certainly was i think he certainly was suspicious of he had a sort of thing about sort of women but having worked with so many bright women and things mm. it, it changed him an awful lot i think mm. um yeah a lot of and yeah a lot of so i think he did have a, a lot of respect but i think it's just such a shame he didn't i mean he was only 49 when he died and so he himself was sort of um these days we consider that a very, almost a young man wasn't exactly it? Know, exactly it's changed yeah so what influence would you say he's had on you, given that you, yes, I appreciate, Katie, you were in advertising briefly, but I mean, in terms of, do you perceive him having had a big influence on your life? Yeah, hugely, yeah. I would say so, yeah. His compassion, his sense of humour, his love of music, mm -hmm. um, and full respect, obviously, for, for the effect, as you told me, worldwide, the effect of his whole oh, idea yeah. of planning has had since. Yeah proud of him yeah yeah very proud of him and um yes i think you're right he he, he i think this that thing that i was saying about trying to seeing the good in people i think mm -hmm. he's really instilled that somehow because i think um i, I feel I, I always try and look for the good in people mm -hmm. um in fact so much like almost the sort of forgetting the sometimes yeah. to one's cost actually mm -hmm. um and um so I'm, and I'm glad i mean although i think he was in some ways quite gullible and quite um easily um i know you probably find that strange because he was quite he was pretty smart but he was quite easy um for people to take advantage of in some ways i think um but um and he knew that um but he um he, he, you know it's good the fact that he could see the good in people i think was his own mm -hmm. he was he wanted to be able to do that. I think that's good. And, and what do you tell your kids about him? Show him pictures. <laughs> yeah. Say, look, this is this is your old grandpa. It's a shame that none of them obviously never. Hmm? Yeah, like never he died before any of them were born. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. it's a real shame. Yeah. But we just say we're very proud of him. He was very influential in the whole advertising hmm. business. So. I've shown pictures of him to my daughter. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and what do they think of advertising? Uh, well, let me see. Uh, I think they're kind of healthily sceptical. <laughs> you <laughs> brought them up well. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you have to be, don't I mean, especially as it's you're so inundated with it now. It's mm -hmm. not like it was then. I, I, I sort of wonder sometimes how he would fit in with the modern you know the whole social media and and the way that everything's advertised now it's so different and it's it's too much it's so in your face mm. now that it w wasn't in those days um and um because people used to actually enjoy the te television i'm not saying there's a good television adverts now but i mean it was a sort of people really did enjoy them very much mm. um in the sort of his 70s yeah. well, heyday there is a kind of paradox because some people um, I mean, I would argue that planning has been a huge success because it's gone everywhere. There are literally ten thousands of planners all over the world. And you, I, I, you can go on websites where you will discover a Vietnamese planner talking to a Taiwanese planner yeah. about some detail about propositions. So you've got that sense of this, this idea, whatever it was, and one can argue about that, going everywhere. But the other side of it is that um, there was terrible advertising in the 60s. And the point of planning was to make advertising better. And I've had some people mm. say to me, planning failed because the ads have got worse. And do we think we respect people anymore? Do we think we understand people any better in terms of how we com communicate with them? And so, you know, the great planning experiment has been a catastrophic failure because we've still got terrible advertising. We should have somehow eliminated that. That was the point of the whole exercise. Uh, I think that's a bit of a generalization. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the same as in music there's some rubbish but yep. there's some really classy mm. memorable mm. adverts that you can't get out of your head like a little miniature film or something yes. mm. so i think that's a bit of a generalization that's to say right. planning i think it's difficult is that you know what's i've heard from people at bmp was and i was listening to someone on a recording yesterday saying you know we were quite confident because actually 
uh, for a while, not only was BNP the best agency in the country, we thought we were the best agency in the world. We were doing stuff that no one else was doing. And, right. we, we, and ordinary people got what we were doing and so on. It was amazing what yeah. we were doing. And so therefore, the sense, well, why couldn't everyone have done it the same? And almost as if, can we actually get back to that, almost that notion of purity of communication where you can engage people, you can, you know, um, yes, there's going to be good music and bad music, <laughs> but um, it's just a shame that there's still so much bad advertising that you think they should, you know, what would be the excuse? They should have long gone. I think well, there's so much of it, and what's horrible, uh, what's, what's not, mm. not so pleasant now is the fact that it's so targeted, but not yes. in a nice sort of way, so that, for example, you just have to visit something, or, you know, and on Google, and boom, fuff, that things come. Yeah. And it is sort of like it's in your face, as I said. It's, mm too much and it's it's just a name brand 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 yes, yes. and you know everyone wanting to get them get it in there not mm. that that sort of message and I think the reason uh, you know be naive I think to think that it's because planning's um, you know so much more efficient or whatever that mm. therefore the advertisements are going to be better they're not yeah. because that depends on the creative mm. input and and that's not necessarily going to improve because you might say the right thing, but you're not necessarily going to do it creatively in a way that's engaging. Sure. So what would you like sort of your father's legacy to be in advertising? What would you like advertising to be like in a few years' time to sort of still have the market Stanley? Um, I think I would say his mark is, is to allow creative people freedom to do what, what is really um, fantastic and interesting mm -hmm. but relevant. And um, I, think, I think sometimes it's... Um, it's a bit cheap skated. Fair enough. And Fair. choose the right product or things. Bringing the moral thing in again, not mm. choosing products that are not good for you and focusing on the ones that... Because he would always stoutly defend the, the product he was promoting. The choice of products is very important, I think. Okay. And the ethical thing behind it, you know. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much, Tess and Katie. That's been...